Good evening. Welcome to our 2018 election forum series here on WEFS and at FloridaToday.com. I'm Isadora Rangel, your host this evening and engagement editor at Florida Today. Tonight on stage, we'd have candidates running for school board district five that covers parts of Palm Bay, West Melbourne and Melbourne. And just a reminder that all school board races will take place during the August 28th primary elections. And just a reminder of our co-sponsors tonight, Eastern Florida State College and the League of Women Voters of the Space Coast, who have partnered with Florida today to make this event happen tonight. And let's go over our rules for a little bit. Each candidate is gonna have one minute to answer my questions, as well as one minute to do their opening statements and their closing statements. Incumbent in District 5, Andy Ziegler, is not able to make it tonight. And one of his challengers, uh, Dean Paterakis, is arriving shortly, I am told, so we'll be waiting for him on stage. But let's start with our opening statements. The first one to go, you have one minute, is Katie Campbell. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie Campbell, and I have lived in Brevard since 2007. We have raised our children here, and they are currently uh, public school students. I have a high schooler, a middle schooler, and an elementary school student. Uh, I am also a teacher. I taught for seven years in Texas and in Kentucky in public schools. And for the last two years, I've been back in the classroom after a 12-year hiatus raising my children. I've been back in the classroom as a substitute. And I substituted in more than 60 classrooms in five schools at all the levels. Um, my desire is to make sure that our school board is the voice for the parents, for the students, and for our communities. And I would like to see um, a school district that is improved in their communication, in their effectiveness, and their responsiveness to the needs of all our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. And Kelly Damerell is going next. Hi, my name is Kelly Damerell. I'm a wife, mother, teacher turned attorney, and experienced advocate. I'm running for the school board in District 5 because I believe we need strong public schools and respected, experienced teachers to prepare our students for college, for careers, and for life. I spent countless hours in the classroom while earning my bachelor's and master's degrees in education, including student teaching kindergarten in Melbourne. I saw firsthand teachers pouring their hearts, their souls, their wallets into their classrooms just to be met with broken promises and excuses from elected officials. And this really lit a fire inside of me that drove me on to law school and then on Washington, D.C where I was the executive director of one nonprofit and the president of another. While there, the budgeting and management and HR experience I gained taught me a simple truth that where the money is spent is where the priorities lie. And our current school board has made it very clear that keeping the best teachers in our classrooms is not their priority. Thank you. Dean Pederakis is next. Welcome on stage. Thank you. My name is Dean Pederakis. I was an Air Force veteran. Um, top secret clearance, I got out to become a teacher, and I taught here in Brevard County and um, had very good success with my students, having um, student scores with the state of Florida in the top 1%. I have seen a lot in the past 20 years here in Brevard, and every year the candidates continue to promise the same thing. And, and every year they come back after they're elected and they continue to promise the same thing. I've decided to want, run one last time. And I'm running because we need to clean up the corruption, the fraud, the waste, and the abuse. The money has to come back into the classroom, not in Vieira and not back to the state where the money is misspent. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to the real issues now. Um, our first question of the night is, the school board voted to table Sheriff Ivy's school marshal program to train and arm school employees who are not teachers. If elected, would you vote to revive that plan and explain why? Kelly, you're going first. No, I do not support the marshal guardian program. I think our students deserve law enforcement professionals. SROs in the classroom and currently we have SROs in our high schools and in our middle schools so what we're talking about is who's going to be staffing our elementary schools our 5 to 11 year olds our most vulnerable population and I think that a 
staffing measure of that uh, degree should not be one made with cost cutting in mind. It shouldn't be made out of a knee jerk reaction. It needs to be a sound and evidence supported uh, decision that we make. And what's more, I think the Marshall program uh, opens us up to some serious legal liabilities, which opens us up to serious financial liabilities uh, that need to be considered. So I think that the students deserve law enforcement professionals, SROs. Thank you, Dean. I spoke about this many times. We are treating the symptom and not the disease. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the kids that are killing kids in our schools. What are we doing to our children to make them decide that it's all right to retaliate in such a way because they were bullied? We're doing something to these kids and we need to address that issue first. The other thing that I've, I've said many times is that we were a nation when duty called, we picked up our guns, we picked up the M16, M1. When we were clerks, we were teachers, we were farmers. And we picked up the gun to defend ourselves. There are many teachers, and when, if I was still a teacher, and I would be more than willing to defend my children. We have to allow the teachers that want to defend their children, the people that are capable to do that. This rent -a cop that we just uh, are gonna spend money for, is not putting our kids in any safe situation. It's actually putting them in more danger. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Katie? Yes, I would vote to bring it back, and this is why. I also agree that uh, we should have our student resource, our school resources officers. To me, it's not an either or, it's a both and. It's not a cost cutting measure. But I've spoken with our law enforcement, um, a couple of members from our sheriff's department, who say that one officer on a campus is not enough in a situation like what we've had several times already this spring. In the amount of minutes, um, disaster can happen. And so they feel like they need, that we need someone else, someone who is unknown, and someone who is a break glass in case of an emergency measure. Someone who's there, that's only their job, and God forbid it ever happened here in Brevard County, but if the unthinkable happens, they're ready. And we do have data, we do have evidence. These kind of programs have been around in the state of Texas, for example, for the last 11 years without incident. So we know that they are, they are happening they're with much less training, half the training, as what our sheriff is proposing for the Guardian program. And so I believe that it is sound and that it would provide that extra layer of protection for our students and it's worth it. Thank you. Our second question is, what do you think about the, the Brevard Public Schools current plan to hire school specialists, which are civilians who will receive a gun and training to react to an active shooter? Dean, you're going first. I've already explained it, it's ridiculous. We have, down in uh, Broward County, we had a real sheriff's deputy not go in. You think these people that were gonna pay 30, 35,000, 40,000 are gonna protect your kids? Um, we have to address the issues. And like I said, there are plenty of male teachers, female teachers that are more than willing to carry. I know uh, many women that carry a gun. And if our teachers are not that capable or you know that they're not allowed to do it because they want to, I understand there's older teachers, there might be teachers that are skittish, they can't handle a gun, but those teachers that can, my gosh, people, if we don't have teachers that are capable in the classroom, then what do you think is gonna happen with our children? Are we teaching children to be uh, self-defending, uh, to, uh, to be capable of doing what needs to be done? Thank you, um, Katie, you're next. First of all, let me make a correction because the, we're not talking about arming teachers. That is a, a quite a You're highly correct. believed misinformation. It's not we're talking about arm, arming teachers. Um, when we talk about these security specialists, the problem I have is that we're talking about, um, as opposed to the Guardian program, we're talking about people either that we already know, they're already in our, our schools, that the administrators know, that the students know, as opposed to new hires who are from outside. Same amount of training, same purpose, but if these people are now not um, not staff that was already there. They don't have a clear role. They're wandering around the school building. From everybody's going to know who they are. So we're going to have them. They definitely need to be identified, like an SRO would be. Um, but I do believe, in the meantime, we've got this gap because we don't have enough SROs to go all over the school to use it for a temporary measure until we can get the manpower to have an SRO in every school. It's something that we are having to do to compromise. But I believe that's a, a short-term fix. Thank you, Kelly. I don't support the security specialists. I think this is another attempt to find a compromise, but it, it misses the mark on both ends, and it's not eligible for state funding. 
Again, I feel our students deserve fully trained law enforcement professionals. SROs do more than just protect the school because the chances of a tragedy happening, we have to be prepared for it, but there is so much more that a SRO can do during the day. They can build a relationship of trust with law enforcement, with the students. They can be there if the student needs to talk about something that's happening at home, they can talk to a law enforcement professional right there in their school. They're part of the school community. And they can be part of a threat assessment team because we need to be more proactive about this, not reactive. We need to have members of the school community who know the students be able to take a threat and uh, analyze whether that should go to mental health services, law enforcement, or something they, were, they just need to talk to the family. I think that the measures the school board's currently taking are not supported by research, they're not supported by teachers' organizations, and they're not supported by law enforcement organizations either. Thank you. And still on the topic of school security, what do you want to see done to hearten school security in, the, in Brevard Public Schools? Um, Katie? Well, we need to make sure that we um, finish off the fencing project that the district actually had started um, before this school year and definitely before February 14th. There are still schools that are very open, and so we need to cooperate with our sheriff's department as they go around and do these inspections and find the weak places. We need to make sure that we really do have, during the school day, a single point of entry. Um, and I'd like to see us uh, involve more um, cameras. Now, those things did not stop um, the tragedy from happening in February, but those are some things that we can have in place. Um, so that we can um, have some deterrence. Well, like I said, some of these older buildings, Oak Alley High, for example, are very difficult um, to enclose, but we need to continue to look for those places and make sure that we're cooperating with our law enforcement so that we can have all those needs met. You. Kelly? We are already making strides, and we were making strides before the, the Stoneman Douglas tragedy. And we're moving towards bulletproof windows, we're moving towards metal detectors, and we're moving towards single point entry. But I think we, again, need to revisit uh, having a, a threat assessment team to identify these issues before they become uh, an issue of how high is the fence, because someone who is, is coming in with this action in mind, they're going to keep moving. I think when we talk about um, how we're going to fund this, we have seen some money come from the bill that was passed to the state legislature. Uh, but it's important when we're planning our new schools and looking at how we're going to do our capital outlays that uh, having schools that have this uh, security measures in mind is uh, an important issue that we make sure to keep in mind. Dean? We've lost all common sense. Um, <laughs> it's children killing children. They're already inside the building. And the one point entry is the most ridiculous thing. You talk to Scott Ellis, you talk to people that use their common sense. All that does, ladies and gentlemen, it's like herding cattle. You have fences around and you got one shooter. He's gonna, once he breaches that entrance, he's got all your kids. If your kids can't jump a fence or run or hide, guess what, they're easy pickings. If we're going to fix this problem, we need to get people that have common sense that will do what is needed. What happened in Parkland, there are a lot of programs put in place, but nobody follow those programs. Having a one entry, putting fences around it, you're just creating prisons for these children. Change that. Fix our schools. Educate our children. That's what needs to be done. Putting more guns, we're going to become Russia, we're going to become these third world nations that carry weapons around the schools. It's ridiculous. This is America, ladies and gentlemen. Stand up and fight up, for Dean. your country. Thank you. Still on the topic of, of Parkland, um, after the school shootings, what, step, what steps would you recommend that schools take to identify children with mental problems, even those with anger issues? And what would you do about the identified children? Kelly, you go first. I touched on it briefly earlier, but this idea of threat assessment teams is supported by uh, hundreds of experts who are looking at solutions outside of just higher walls and barbed wire. It's about being part of the school community. It's about giving students who can identify other students that might need a little more help, where they can go and talk to someone that they can trust. We need to make sure we have the right resources in place to provide for the social and emotional health of these children. Because the, they're going through some of the, the strongest and toughest changes of their lives, and a lot of them have even more than that going on at home. We need to make sure that there are members of the school community there that can 
treat them. We need mental health counselors, and while it's not always a mental health issue that's gonna drive this, we need to have that available to the students. We need to have the principals and, and the administrative officials know everything that's going on, and we need a law enforcement professional that can help refer in the right direction. Dean? Again, we have ruined our schools. All we need to do is show love to these children. What has happened is that we're pushing these kids through a system that only rewards those who are academically good. And, and, it, and, it, and it, the attitude from the teachers, because these children who are not pulling their weight and making high scores on their tests, they get bullied by even the teachers. And they don't want those kids in their classroom because guess what? It ruins their pay and their raises and everything else. Show a little love. When I was teaching, I could tell as a classroom teacher who are, were my tr uh, trouble students. If you took the time to sit down with some of these children, you wouldn't have it. There have been many cases where the secretary has stopped these massive shootings just by talking to a child the way that we need to talk to children. But unfortunately, we put so much testing in front of what's good for the child, and so teachers are overwhelmed where they don't have the time to stand back Thank and you, sit Dean. and talk with children like we used Thank to. You. Thank you. Katie. I think we got off just a little bit. Would you repeat the question? Sure. Um, after the Parkland shooting, what steps would you recommend that schools take to identify children with mental problems, even those with anger issues? And what would you do about the, these identified children? One of the things that we saw with Parkland was a lack of communication between the schools and, and law enforcement and within the school. I think one of the things that we need to do, you know, the students know each other. Um, they know each other well. And we need to have a safe place where the students can come and share their concerns with other students, um, where teachers can express those concerns. And the teachers need to be listened to. They know their students. They see the signs. They see changes in behavior. And um, one of the things that's happened with our current discipline plan is the teachers aren't being listened to as well. They're not being supported. And so it's actually frequently not the child who's being the, disruptive, but being the disruption in the classroom that, that is the one who is turning into these anger issues. It's the one who's being bullied by that student. And so we need to make sure that our discipline plan is consistent so that we don't um, create these. We need to have that identification going on so they can get the help before we get uh, to the situation where they're acting out on these feelings in a tragic way. Thank you. Now let's move on to teacher raises. Florida Today asked uh, our readers what questions would you ask during the forum, and teacher raises was definitely uh, one of the most popular ones. So I've tried to incorporate everyone's questions here. Uh, but the first one I want to ask is, would you ever support a property tax increase to increase funding for teacher pay? If not, is there another mechanism to fund teacher raises? Uh, and the first one to go is Dean. <laughs> well, when you give away $8 million in a no-bid contract, there's plenty of money to give to teachers if you spent your money correctly. No, I would not support. I've not supported the tax increase that they had four years ago, or whatever it was, because it doesn't go in the right places. We should have been paying teachers a long time ago, but it's not going to happen with the current board, and you're not going to have it with this board or anyone else on this candidate, unless you elect somebody that has common sense, that knows how money is spent, that is successful in their own business, can squeeze every penny and use that penny wisely. When we give away $8 million, this is not the first time. Four years ago, we, sp out we spent $3.3 million giving uh, contracts to friends and family that we got caught on. And before that, it was $1.2 million when we built a, a Rockledge um, field that could have been done for a lot cheaper. Two years from now, it's going to be $10 million that's going to be misspent until you get someone that is going to hold them accountable. And unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you won't you. get Your that unless with me. Thank, Thank you. you. Katie? Absolutely. Our teachers need to have an increase in salary, but as far as if this question is specifically about the way to do it, um, I would not support uh, a tax increase. And this is why I believe that we still have um, in our budget um, some room to cut and that we still have some projects that need to be um, let go of, but we do need to be uh, paying them a competitive salary with the counties around us and so that we can retain experienced teachers. But one of the things that happens when we um, do a millage type tax increase is that we're actually also taxing the people we're trying to help. 
which includes the teachers. And so um, such a broad uh, measure, which would actually generate more than we would need without having definition, um, which is the one that they were uh, looking at earlier this summer, um, I don't think that would be appropriate. Kelly? Well, I believe the question was, would I support putting it on the ballot? And I always support giving the voters a chance to weigh in on issues of, these measure, of this measure when it comes to uh, whether or not they want to chip in a little bit more so teachers can have cost of living raises or with this particular measure that the school board voted down, uh, security increases. And I think for many of our teachers, uh, it's not going to impact them because many of them are not paying property tax, they're renting because they aren't able to make the compensation to save up a down payment to own a home. And for a career that should be so revered, I, I think it's abhorrent that we haven't given them the appropriate cost of living raises uh, in, in the past decade and, and that they're having to claw and scratch to just ask for a cost of living uh, raise recently. So I'm always going to support the voters' voice, the chance for the public to speak out and vote on this in a ballot. And if the school board won't put this on the ballot in one way, then the voters are going to make their voice heard in the ballot in another way. Thank you. And still on the same topic, as you might remember, uh, this year's uh, negotiation over teachers' raises were very contentious between the district and the teachers' union. So my question to you, to you is, do you support the role of teacher unions in negotiating salaries? And if elected, how are you going to go about smoothing uh, out those negotiations? Um, Katie, you're first. Our teachers' union um, does fight very hard every year for these races, and rightly so. Um, I do believe that um, if you put people on the school board who care about the teacher raises, and because these are the number one people in the classroom who are affecting our children's education, that it wouldn't even take the extreme measures that they've had to take. Um, we need to make sure that the people on the board support their teachers. They know what it's like to be in the classroom, and they're, they have brilliant relationships with teachers. Um, so as far as smoothing things over, we need, they need to be listened to, and we need to make, uh, you know, myself, I taught for seven years, uh, just as a point of uh, information, I went and looked to see how much I would make uh, if I came into the school district, Brevard of the seven counties around us would pay me the least. And so we want to make sure that we're doing a good job of not just attracting experienced teachers, but retaining them as well. Thank you. Kelly? We do want to retain and attract the best teachers, and unfortunately, we're losing our best teachers to neighboring counties where they're getting 4% raises. Here, the teachers have to walk out to get even in the neighborhood of 2%, less than 2%. It's, it's frustrating, and I understand where the union's coming from, why they have to come to the table ready for a fight because that's that's how it's been it's been adversarial i'm hoping with new board members with fresh faces that we can sit down from a place of trust and a place of transparency that builds that trust where we sit down and look at the budget together and we're going to have to make some really tough choices there's always a little fat to trim but not as much as as you might hope However, we have to retain the base of our schools. The foundation of our schools are these excellent teachers. And so there are some things we might have to put on hold for a little while to make sure we stop losing our best to neighboring counties. Dean? Kelly, um, uh, she thinks that changing faces on the board, putting new faces on the board is going to change things. I've been doing this for uh, 15, 10 years plus, and the faces have changed, the agenda stays the same. I belong to the Teamsters Union with UPS and it's a day and night compared to BFT. BFT is a self-serving um, union that has done very little to help their profession. I have spoken many times to BFT about cleaning up their teachers, especially the ones that abuse students. And they get upset because I name names who have been either let go, convicted, or caught uh, doing unmentionable things to students. So if you want teachers to have respect, then you've got to clean those bad apples. And BFT is a self-serving union that does nothing for the teachers, but only for themselves. And they were the ones that endorsed the other candidates before me in previous times. So you guys reap what you sow. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's let's go over some of the the past actions of the board. Um, the district earlier this year approved. $14 million in new projects such as reopening South Lake Elementary in Titusville, relaunching corridor busing for students who attend schools outside their neighborhood, and hiring an armored car service to transport money. Do you support these expenditures and why? The first one to go is Kelly. I think we need to go to the table with our teachers before we start funding individual projects. I think the way the budget is currently handled uh, is reversed of what it should be. We should shore up the foundation and then go to these projects. I do not support the armored cars because I think that is uh, a showy way to try to fix a problem, not the actual solution uh, that financial experts will tell you that will avoid uh, the kind of financial problems that cause them to go after the armored car solution. Regional busing, though, is going to help some of our students uh, take advantage of these excellent choice program students that would not be able to get there otherwise. So it's difficult to lump all those together, but I think we need to make sure we're taking care of our teachers first before we start funding some smaller projects. Dean? Florida today has not been paying attention or they just uh, flat out ignore what's been happening. I have been for the past 10 years, I don't know where my opponents have been, but I have been speaking on behalf of what's been going on. And I was at the school board meeting when they were trying to close these schools six years ago or four years ago, I can't even remember now, but it was a while back. And, I, I, and that was the same time that they were giving away the $8 million. And I said, you're giving away an $8 million contract, but you're closing three schools that will only save $3 million. Yes. So here we are again, we're talking about the same issues and it's like beating the dead horse. But I'm telling you, if you continue to support these, these um, candidates that give free cars to the superintendent at the tune of, and, and give their salaries $210,000, and all he is is a figurehead, that $210,000 should come back to the classroom. That, that should give raises to the teachers. So there are, and you don't give a company car that taxpayers pay for, so this, past uh, um, uh, uh, superintendent can go back Your and forth to Broward updating. because, thank you, thank you. Move on well, to Katie. you get the picture. Thank you. There, there are some needs definitely, and I know the school board tried to come and, and took look at all these projects and, and put them in the order, but I agree with Kelly. If we're going to have a priority on our teachers, the number one determiners in the classroom of what's going, of our student success, um, then we need to start there and see what's left over. Um, as far as reopening South Lake, that particular idea, uh, because we need uh, more choice schools in the north end of the county, um, and we've talked about overcrowding, um, uh, opening a new school will take care, alleviate, alleviate some of that because students can come from all over. The regional busing, I'll just be honest and tell you that my own child is going to be doing regional busing, but I told her myself, look, if they cut regional busing, if I'm on the school board and it's only going to benefit us, I'm not going to keep it. Um, but, if it's going, but I do like the idea of students to be able to go to, especially some of these career and technical opportunities that they don't have locally. The armored car service was over the top. People who work at Chick-fil-A transport more cash every day, and our school bookkeepers can do that well. We could have done centralized booking without the armored car service. Thank you, and you brought up the issue, to, the issue of overcrowding, which is, leads to my next question. There are some schools in Brevard that are overcrowded, while some are being, are being underutilized. How should the board address this issue? Uh, some of the options which the board has explored in the past includes uh, building new schools, uh, changing district boundaries, which has proven to be quite controversial with parents, or buying more portables. How would you approach this issue? Dean, you go first. We, as citizens of the state of Florida, have passed a constitutional amendment that we should have only a certain amount of kids in our classroom. Instead of adhering to those constitutional amendments, we tend to go with special interest groups and spend more money in testing these tests that do very little to improve education. Millions and millions of dollars go to these tests, to these special interest group testing companies. Wouldn't it be nice to take that money and bring it back to the classroom? Wouldn't it be nice to have those small classrooms that we, the citizens, have voted for? But our legislatures, le legislature doesn't want to listen to the citizens. They're more beholden to the special interest group. I will change that. 
I will fight for every student and every teacher, and we will get things done. But we need somebody that can do it. Katie? This uh, issue of rezoning was particularly contentious in my neck of the woods down at West Melbourne. And one of the things that we found out through the process was that the data was not completely accurate and that the, the data that was provided did actually not also look at projected growth. And some of the areas that they were going to move students to uh, are in areas that in the next few years along the Parkway, St. John's Parkway, are going to have hundreds of, and thousands of homes built. Um, and then we ended up with one of the schools that said it was too crowded, Mel High ended up being a school that actually is not going to be frozen this coming up school year. It's going to be open. So we didn't have accurate data. And before we start moving people out of their neighborhood schools where they have bought homes in specific areas, we need to make sure that we have good data. We need to make sure that we're taking into account the charter schools that are being built that will alleviate some of these programs. And these choice programs where students have opportunities to go to other schools to pursue interests that um, will help them to find a job and to specialize in certain careers because those kinds of things um, will help. In the meantime, because we don't have the money or the numbers to provide uh, to build new schools, we need to look at the portable issue. Kelly? No child likes it when their boundaries change. No parent likes moving their child to a lower performing school. When my husband and I bought our house, the local elementary school had been A school for a long time. Last year it was B school. This year it's a C school. We're lucky that we live in a district with choice options and we're lucky that we have the return of regional busing. But I think it's gonna be really important that we are able to work closely with local charter schools. Right now, it, it is not very much in, it, within the school board's authority as to where these schools pop up, and we have to reach out to them and make them part of this growth and expansion plan. Otherwise, we're gonna to continue to have these planning problems of knowing where overcrowding is gonna be and where schools are gonna be underpopulated. So we have to work closely with the emerging charter schools. But in the meantime, I took many classes in portables. They're not ideal and they Thank need you. to be a stopgap measure. Thank you. Um, now let's move on to charter schools. Um, the legislature in the last couple of years has passed laws that require districts to share capital dollars with charter schools, which are privately run, and they give incentives for charter schools to open next to struggling public schools. What do you think about the legislature's move to help charter schools? Um, Katie, you go first. Well, one of the facts that's not commonly known is that um, Charter schools only receive 80 cents to the dollar of the amount that public, their regular public schools, or both public schools, receive. And so they're only getting 80% of the funding per student. The funding goes with the student. So the money is not leaving the public schools, it's going with the student. And like I said, charter schools only get 80% of that. 5% of that they actually pay back to the school district for um, a software that they have to use um, for accountability. Um, and so I do believe that it is important um, so that our parents can find the best fit for their children. And we live in an age where it's overwhelming. I've already done this several times already to all the choices that our, that our students have, but so that we can make sure that each student um, has the best fit for them. And so if the charter schools are the ones that are doing it and several of them are being very successful, then I think that we need to continue to, um, to do what the law says, which is actually to support them unless there's one of the, the five reasons that they are, cannot be allowed. But we need to go ahead and approve those so that they can um, create those opportunities for our families. Thank you. Katie, your thoughts on the legislature's move to help charter schools? So I'm really saddened that so much local authority has, around charter schools has been taken away from the school board, has been usurped by the state. Uh, that's particularly given the strength of the charter school lobby in Tallahassee and the terrible tactics that we've seen from for-profit charter schools. That they can take taxpayer money and build a building today and sell it for their own profit tomorrow. Again, they're not required to work with the school board as to where they're located, which makes planning very difficult. And I'm gravely concerned about the lack of oversight and the lack of accountability. Now, I've heard stories from parents who had uh, troubles in public school and charter school may have been uh, somewhere where their students could find success, but um, those stories may be compelling. And some of the charter schools in Brevard are really excellent, but without proper oversight, we don't know that those A's are earning those students are earning are truly A's, uh, and we don't know that failing schools are failing until it's way too late because of this lack of accountability, because of this lack of oversight, because legislators in Tallahassee are looking to help out their for-profit charter friends. Thank you. Dean? 
Well, you got to ask yourself, why are these ch uh, charter schools successful? I taught at Royal Palm Elementary, which was a charter school in Palm Bay, and I can tell you this, these charter schools don't have the overhead that public school systems have. It's amazing how well they can do with their children and not have a Vieira, where you go by uh, uh, James, Judge James Jameson any afternoon and you see a thousand cars and there's no students at that school. What are they doing with employing all these people up there? Bring back the money into the classroom. That's why the charter schools are winning. If we did things like we used to do in America, even when we had the one-room schoolhouse, ladies and gentlemen, we taught our children so much better than what we're doing right now. And it's because we've become a bureaucracy and we're not addressing the issues that are, to our, that are needed for our students. Again and again, I don't know how to beat it in your head, but you've got to go and use your common sense. Things have got to change before public schools is gone, disappeared. Thank you. And still on this same topic, uh, voters in November will vote on a constitutional amendment proposal called Revision 8. It would do a couple of things. One of them, it establishes term limits for school board members and also would allow charter schools to bypass approval from local districts and get it from a state entity instead. This has become a very controversial measure, but do you support this proposal in November? Uh, Kelly, you go first. I think it's a shame that they've grouped these two very different ideas together just because they share the word school. <laughs> I think you'll notice that uh, the incumbent is not here tonight and he is running for a third term and he did speak out, unsurprisingly, in favor of not having term limits for school board members. I think it's important that we get fresh ideas and some fresh faces and perhaps people that have different better, more valuable experience on the board. And when it comes to the, the charter school issue, again, I, I'm very concerned about taking home rule away and, and giving it up to Tallahassee, that how do they know how our students uh, feel here, how, what our growth is, where new communities are developing, and where those schools are needed. There's already such limited authority of the school board when it comes to charter schools. They want to take all of that away so they can support their for-profit charter friends in Tallahassee, and I think that's a shame. Thank you. Dean? I think it's great that Nick and other people are wanting to make some changes, hopefully to make changes to where it has an effect, but like I've said many times, the faces may change, but the agenda stays the same. So even if you have term limits, we've seen it here in Brevard County, it's a um, musical chair situation. You get a different person, a different face, but they're all beholden to the good old boys of Brevard County. So until you as the voter inform yourselves, you're going to vote for the person that has the most signs, the person that gets the most money from the special interest groups, and the person that has the influence that can do that. You're not going to vote for the little guy that wants to fix things because he can't afford the signs. He can't afford because to run for school board, you need at least ten to twenty thousand dollars minimum to run for school board. But you're not going to vote for that guy. You're going to vote for the Andy Ziegler's. You're going to vote for the Matt Susans. You're going to vote for those people that do the same thing as their predecessor did. And do Thank you, you support Revision Eight or not? Yes or no? Do I what? do you support the the constitutional ballot measure? It's it's. It's not going to fix it unless the voters do. Yes or no? You can do it. Uh, it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Yeah, sure. Eight, move on eight to years, it. then you'll see the same thing, whatever. Thank you. We'll move on and to Katie. Move on. It's unfortunate that the Constitutional Revision Committee put so many of the 13 uh, amendments bundled uh, with unrelated items. As far as the term limits go, I'm all for them, from the presidency down to the local school boards. As far as um, civics, which is one of the issues being mandated, um, it's already part of the curriculum, but it certainly doesn't hurt to make sure that it's there permanently. Um, the reason why this uh, charter school part is there is because some of the local school boards have disregarded the laws concerning their responsibilities to approve or disapprove um, charter schools because they simply didn't want them in their areas um, and but my concerns with this being a part of the uh, with this particular measure is that a long distance supervision from the state level which is an even bigger bureaucracy than our county school board um, might be a problem and I also think this could have been taken care of through re regular legislation rather than through a constitutional amendment um, so it's a mixed bag thank you
So let's move on to the issue of homelessness, which has become a growing issue here in Brevard. The number, the number of homeless students in Brevard County Schools has grown by about 30% since last year to almost 3,000 students who are referred to as in transition. Do you have any ideas or plan for addressing this growing program, which can include working with different partners, but do you have any thoughts on how the school board can help with this cause? Uh, Dean, you go first. Educate. The, the one thing that will help a child get out of poverty is to educate. It's a shame what I've seen in our schools when we give free lunches and free um, um, after school programs, what happens is you give this false um, perception that if a child, and I've seen this firsthand with teachers, kids don't come in with homework, but they're still fed. They're still put a roof over their head. They're still given a, so when they come out in 18 years and they're, they're still de relying on government to take care of them, whose fault was that? It wasn't the child's, we taught them that. So there should, if you wanna fix poverty, that's where our schools are the first in line to do that, but you gotta do it the right way. Teach the students that there is consequence when you don't bring homework in. My parents starved. They were hungry if they didn't do their job or as little kids. Why are we teaching kids if they don't do anything, if they're lazy, they still get fed? Thank Ridiculous. You. Katie? One of the things that's been important to me from the beginning is community involvement. And we have great nonprofits around Brevard County who are already working uh, on this, this problem and trying to find uh, solutions. This is their goal and their main purpose. And so I think as a school district and as a schools individually that uh, the role of the school is to identify and to help and to make sure that we can connect these families, these students and their families with these organizations who are already in place in the county um, so that they can get the services that they need. Uh, we need nonprofits, whether it's um, you know groups like uh, Nana's House or uh, Love Inc. and those kinds of organizations, local churches who are involved and want to be involved in our, our schools and our families' lives because they are already doing that job. And um, so we can refer to people to who are already, who are already doing it and doing it well. Katie, I mean, I'm sorry, Kelly. This is a place where. Uh, Empathy is just going to be a, a, a deep motivator. And having spent time in the Title I schools, having seen children come in hungry, they cannot learn their ABCs on empty tummies. They cannot progress in math or science or any other area if they don't know where they're going to go home to that night. So yes, we definitely need to work with our nonprofit partners. I jumped right into community service when I returned to Brevard becoming a member of the, the Junior League, becoming an advisory board member of the Children's Hunger Project, because making sure that children have those basic needs met so that they can then open their minds up to education uh, is the vital first step. I also think we might be able to look into our grants department. Right now we have one person writing grants for the district. That is a department that can pay for itself and help some of these areas that these children uh, have the greatest needs. Thank you. Our next question is about our current school sales tax, which is, be, which is to be used for educational technology, district security, and facility renewal. Will you support asking voters to renew it when it expires in 2020? If not, how do you plan to pay for the millions in capital needs the district has identified? Katie, you go first. Um, when this measure first passed, um, four years ago, um, one of the things that made it palatable was because we put uh, a, a time limit on it of six years and we also put an oversight committee. Um, I am glad to see that we've actually, because of the economy picking up, been able to bring in more money than we expected and so we've actually been able to meet those needs. Dr. Blackburn also told me a few months ago, I met with him, that we've actually been able to come under budget in some of the projects. And so um, they've actually done what they said. They were accountable. And so, um, with that said, I think in 2020, if we try to take all of those measures, the security uh, expenses are not going away, and put them back in the operational budget, we're gonna have a really hard time keeping up with our teacher pay. And so this kind of tax, uh, because we're already having, I, I, I could support putting that back on the ballot, because as long as we have a short term amount of time, six years or less, again, and make sure that we have that oversight committee so that the public knows that we're actually doing with our dollars what we said we're going to do, and this puts the tax burden not just on the residents. Kelly? I, again, will always support allowing the 
taxpayers, the voters themselves, to weigh in on issues of taxation. And this current use of the sales tax has been exceptional. It's been on time, it's been under budget. I've also had the opportunity to meet with uh, the superintendent at length to discuss budgetary issues, and this is one where we're really knocking it out of the park. But we have to be aware that many of our schools are over 50 years old, and they're not getting any younger. Issues are gonna keep coming up. And if we can make the same case to the voters and they wanna support it, the schools could certainly, certainly use it. For example, many of our middle schools are just finally getting AC in their gymnasiums, which, my goodness, uh, some of those odors are gonna have seeped into the walls and they're not coming out, but we're gonna do everything we can to make sure our schools are at least the bare minimum of, of comfort for our students to be able to focus on learning. Dean? This is the difference between Kelly and Katie. We haven't been spending the money appropriately. The armored cars are a good example. I figured it out, it was only about average $700 that these schools were carrying, and that's if it was all cash. Some of it was checks. So, you know, you know the old saying, you save for a rainy day? We we have a windfall. Look at your property taxes. Your homes have gone up. Your taxes for the schools have gone up through the roof, and they got so much money that they're just spending it willy-nilly. And you know what's gonna happen when the bubble breaks again? They're gonna come back to you for more money. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that at home? Like, hey, we're doing great this year. Let's spend, let's go take, get loans. Let's go do this and do that. And then you run out of money. Well, where are we gonna go? Let's go to our neighbor. He'll give us some more money. No, that doesn't happen. So why does it happen in our schools? Somebody's gotta get on there that knows finances, has been there, done that, and holds every single person accountable. Lots of money could have been gone to the teachers, but they didn't. Why? Thank you. And increasingly across Florida, we're expanding school choice options, such as allowing students to attend a school outside of their, their designated uh, neighborhood. What is your view about uh, the choice options, and how do you think they will affect our schools, and do you support it, even increasing it? Uh, and Kelly, you go first. I think we already have some excellent choice options, specifically when it comes to technical education programs where we're giving students multiple pathways to success and the ability to have great jobs right out of high school without the monkey of student loans on their back. But I think we have to be thoughtful moving forward with these programs and make sure that we have uh, the busing and, and other options so that they're open to students at all income levels. Because when we're talking about Lotteries, we don't want to leave student success up to chance. When we're talking about whether students can get to these programs, we don't want only students who their parents are able to buy them a car or both parents aren't working so they can transport them to those programs uh, for those programs to be open to them. So as long as these programs are open and accessible and offer a variety of, uh, of educational options, we have to be thoughtful about the, that direction we're moving and make sure we're not um, hurting our, our planning options or hurting our neighborhood community public schools. Thank you, Dean. I was fortunate my children were in the lottery and they got to go to West Shore. But my question is, it's a choice school, my question is, how come we don't have 100 schools like West Shore? Why aren't we holding students accountable? Because at West Shore, if you don't do your homework, if you don't keep up, guess what, you're kicked out and we hold education, they hold education to a tier. And that's why it's so much easier to teach at West Shore. You ask any teacher where they wanna teach at the Choice School. I taught at um, West Melbourne School for Science and there was no behavior issues. Why? Because they held them accountable. If they didn't, if they didn't bring the mustard, then they went home to their own uh, home school. So why aren't we modeling that to our home schools? Why aren't we giving that same education to every student? in Coco, in Palm Bay, everywhere. Why aren't they getting that education? That's the question to ask. Not that we need to open up more choice schools, but to make every school a choice school. Thank you, Katie. We have more options today than ever before. I know because I just signed my uh, daughter, my oldest up to uh, go to a certain high school and she had more options. It was almost overwhelming. One of the great things about that is the specialized programs that our, our schools are offering, not just at the high school, but some of the middle school levels as well, is that you 
have the, you increase the motivation for the students. They're in a program that interests them. They're in a program that will lead to a career. They're learning about something that will help them in the future. And so the motivation to do well in school, to, to increase attendance, to be involved in their program, that all of that goes into helping our students. And so these programs are wonderful. I want to, we do need to make sure that they're matching up with the career field um, so that we've got you know, all these job openings we've been hearing about, and not just in our county, but in the state. We need to make sure that those programs match up with the industries that are going on. That we do have the STEAM, the STEM, uh, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics programs covered. But I think we, these programs are great, and we need to continue them. Thank you. And one of the roles, one of the roles of the school board is to lobby the legislature for funding and policies. If elected, what would, what would be your priorities when requesting things from Tallahassee? Dean, you go first. Yeah. You need somebody that'll fight. You know, every opponent that I've had before always said they were against Common Core, and they've done nothing since they've been on the board. And if Andy Ziegler was here, he'd say, I'm against Common Core, but has done nothing. You need a fighter, ladies and gentlemen. You need somebody that is willing to put their necks out there. That doesn't hold the school board job as their uh, bread and butter, their income. I decided that I'm going to give my first year of uh, being on the board, the $40,000 that we get, that's going to go to charity. And guess that's where that's going to go? To children that need food or need shelter, that are homeless, or even a teacher that it shows me, or teachers that show that they need help. But again, you need somebody that is a fighter. I've seen way too many new faces on the board and all they do is fall right in line. And I hope you guys have come to the realization that it's time for a real change. Somebody that'll fight for you. Katie, what would you request from the legislature? I what think would I, I, I have been. No, sorry. that's for Katie, I'm no, sorry. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm just sorry. repeating the question. No, I thought you were that's all right. Um, I think we need to constantly put before our legislators the reminder that this is the priority. Funding education is their priority. It's the one thing that we can't stop doing uh, before everything else because this is our future. These are our teachers that are impacting our students. And so the funding needs to be, the priority needs to be there. Now I understand some of the the hesitancy on the behalf of the legislature when it, because they look around at some of the school districts and they're not spending the money the way that should or speaking on other things instead of um, things that would be effective. Um, but we need to make sure that that is a priority. And, and we need to make sure as a school district that we are using those uh, funds wisely, that we're managing them wisely so the legislature doesn't have a reason to come back and say, nope, we're only going to give you this and you have to use it in this certain way. We need to show good management and good accountability, a good stewardship of what we've been given so that we can continue to uh, increase the funding so we can pair teachers and retain our workforce, our excellent work workforce, and make sure that our students' needs are being met. Kelly, your request from Tallahassee. Well, I have experience advocating to elected leaders at the highest level, to senators, to members of Congress, to the White House. And I often had to push back, but that is best done when building coalitions of people to push back with. So working with other school board members, working with teaching organizations, showing a united force that will no longer stand for falsely rolling back the millage rate to make people feel as if the values of their homes aren't increasing when they very much are. And the schools in their area need to be able to keep up with that. And making sure that they no longer steal from the operating funds, that they're not taking away from the only fund from which teachers can be paid to pay for other line items that already have their own special designations. Because without that uh, supported operating budget, there's no way we're gonna be able to make sure our teachers are getting their necessary cost of living increases. And our last question, um, because we're running out of time, you actually have 30 seconds instead of a minute, um, and it should be simple to answer. Do you support the school board's decision to forego a national search and appoint District Chief Operating Officer Mark Mullins as the next superintendent, and what should be his priorities? 30 seconds again instead of one minute. Uh, Katie, you go first. Um, I do support it because at the time, especially with the funding the way we are, I don't think that uh, we needed to uh, 
endure such expenses. Um, from all the teachers that I've spoken to, they're excited about Dr. Mullins. I haven't gotten a chance to meet with him yet. We'll be doing that in a few weeks. They're excited about him being the leader. I think his priority needs to be finding the funding so it makes sure we can pay our teachers well and make sure that we get this security issue in place um, as soon as possible. Kelly? I understand the, the purpose was to try to maintain the strategic plan and, and maintain certainty when a lot of the school board members could be turning over, but I don't think that was worth the cost of due diligence, that saving uh, what seems like a lot of money now could cost millions should things go the wrong way, and that's something that doing due diligence in the search process can avoid. Without any uh, comments on the superintendent uh, incoming himself, uh, we should we have a pattern of not doing due diligence and it coming back to bite us. And I really genuinely hope this is not another example of it. Dean? Finally, I agree with Kelly. Um, <laughs> this superintendent is bad news, ladies and gentlemen. And unfortunately, again, it's the good old boys of Brevard County that are pushing the wrong people in the leadership of our schools. Um, I know him personally. I know that he pushed me out, had the police uh, escort me out when I was fighting the Common Core. Um, so w he's not there for the students and like I said I I can care less if you vote for me or not but I'm gonna tell you the truth and if you want somebody that will actually uh, stand up for the kids then you need to elect somebody that will tell you Indeed. the truth and Thank actually you. that's a good segue into your closing statement you have one minute and we'll start with you and then move this way all right ladies and gentlemen um, as you know um, faces a change you've seen it all the time um, but it concerns me because um, I've been fighting for the kids who have been sexually abused and I thought when we got rid of Andrea Alford who was head of security that things would change. Now with the Sheriff Wayne Ivey being in there, uh, we have uh, issues and even more issues because of the cover up. What concerns me is we have Tina Deskovich who is a school board member right now who told a friend of mine that Dean was right. Dean is absolutely right. There's things that are going on in schools that are affecting our children but we don't see her saying anything. We don't see any of the uh, school board members saying anything. Why is that? Why are people going along to get along? But it's happened before. We've seen it with Jerry Sandusky in Penn State. We've seen it with Bill Cosby. We've seen it with Feinstein. We've seen it with all of uh, Dr. Nassar with the Michigan. We need to clean up our schools. And unfortunately, Wayne Ivey is the biggest, one of the biggest problems we are having issues in our schools when it comes to the safety of our children. Thank you. Kelly. I've dedicated my entire life to education. I'm Florida born and raised. I'm a proud graduate of the University of Florida three times over. My husband was born and raised in Palm Bay. He went to Lockmore Elementary in Southwest Middle and was valedictorian at Palm Bay High School. So when we thought about a great place to raise our daughter, Molly, we knew this was it. And I want to make sure every child in Brevard has those same educational opportunities that he had. Part of that is making sure that the board is fulfilling its utmost responsibility of being diligent about the budget. When I took over as interim executive director of a nonprofit, my first task was to reduce that budget by 50%. And I was able to do that without letting go of a single staff member and making sure they got their cost of living raises that had been long put off. We have to make sure that we are giving our students every educational opportunity possible, that there are multiple paths to success, because they are part of our community, they're part of our economy, and they're gonna be part of an educated workforce. They are the future. Thank you, I'm just gonna ask you to wrap up real quickly, I apologize, we're running out of time for your closing statements. Okay. As I've talked to voters uh, about what they're looking for, um, they want someone who actually lives in our district. Sorry, Dean. Um, they want someone who has real experience teaching in the classroom. And they want someone who's not connected to, uh, more connected to businesses than they are to students and parents and teachers in our community. Um, I want that too. And even though I didn't uh, originally want this job, I'm called, I feel like I'm called to do that, called to run at least, and to challenge um, what's been going on in the school district. I want to represent our parents and our teachers, our community, in a way um, that brings that understanding all together and so that we can have the best school district that we possibly can. Thank you thank so you. much and thank you all for being here tonight. That's a wrap up for our school board district five forum. Make sure to go to floridatoday.com to check our story and you can rewatch our forum as well. Thank you.